We do not lose heart. Paul knows the secret to not losing heart, and he shares the secret with us in this passage. I want to spend our time with these verses today, and I want to talk on the thought of not losing heart. I want to show you some truths in these verses that will help you to faint not, even when life is most discouraging. Go with me through this text, be encouraged and motivated, and have hope in the living Lord. In verse 16, Paul says, for which cause we faint not. That is an amazing statement. The word faint refers to a falling of the heart. So the phrase can be read this way. We do not lose heart. Paul is telling us that regardless of what comes his way, he does not give up. He does not give in. He does not give out. He does not lose heart. It is so easy to lose heart, isn't it? It's easy to come to a place when you're ready to throw in the towel, to lay down your burdens and just quit. It seems to me, just from reading what the Bible says about the life of Paul, that it would have been easy for Paul to lose heart. But he says, we faint not. That little phrase is in the present tense, the active voice. Paul is saying, I will never lose heart. He isn't bragging. He's just making a simple statement of fact. Paul has discovered a spiritual secret that has enabled him to be encouraged, even when the midst of circumstances that would have discouraged anyone else. Paul's life was anything but easy. Consider two passages that speak of the problems Paul was forced to endure in his life. Now, these come from the King James Version. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despair even of life? 2 Corinthians 1 8. The second passage is a little longer. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. It labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day. I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak, I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not. 2 Corinthians 11, 23-29. So these passages really speak to the problems that Paul endured in his life. Yet, in spite of all those trials and tribulations and burdens, Paul was able to say, I never lose heart. Is there any one of you who can echo this sentiment? Is there anyone here who can say, I never get discouraged. I never want to give up. I'm always encouraged, excited, and energized about my life and my walk with the Lord. No one here can say that. We all stumble from discouragement to discouragement. We all want to quit from time to time. We want to just stop and give them more because we feel that we've given up we can. Most of us are like David, who said in the Psalms, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. If we would be honest, we would all have to admit that we would at times like to sprout a pair of wings and fly far away from trials, tribulations, and troubles of this life. I know that myself, I've been there many times. I'm sure all of you have too. While there are many times when leaving troubles and afflictions behind seems like the best option, I'm far more interested in reaching the place where I can say what Paul said. I'm far more interested in reaching a place where I can say, I faint not, I do not lose heart. I believe that place is available to every one of God's children. I believe that place is available to you. 
As I've, as I've already said, it is so easy to lose heart, isn't it? The reason it's so easy is found in verse 16. Paul identifies a common struggle that we all face. Paul says, though our outward man perishes, the reason it's so easy for us to lose heart is that our outer man is perishing. The outer man refers to the fleshy part of us. It accompanies both the body and the mind. The results of aging in the body and sin in the mind conspire to strip away joy, hope, and peace of heart and mind. We are told that the outer man is perishing. The word perish means to rot, to ruin, corrupt, to be destroyed. The word destroyed seems to fulfill the intended meaning here. The same word is used in a few other important verses. These verses drive home the power of this thought. Luke 12, 33, sell that ye have and give alms, provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heaven that falleth not, where no thief, thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. In that verse, the word corrupteth is the same word that is translated perished in our text. Like moths can destroy clothing, the outer man is being al eaten alive every single day. Revelations 8, 8 through 9. And the second angel sounded as if it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea had life, died, and the tells us here that God will cast a great stone into the sea, and one third of the world's ships will be capsized, consumed, destroyed. Same word, every day, the outer man is being destroyed by the pain, problems, burdens, and trials that are thrown against it. The reason we are so prone to lose heart is because our outer man is being destroyed, corrupted, and ruined every day. So we do not lose heart, Though our outer man, our body, our brain, our lungs, everything, our bones are wasting away, are being destroyed, are being eaten away, are being capsized, are being consumed, and are being wiped out. This destruction of the outer man comes from two sources. The first source is the fallen nature. The whole natural world is under the curse of God because of sin. The world is under a curse of futility, pain, suffering, corruption, and death. This is, this is said to us in Romans 8, 22 through 23, and I read, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Just to remind you, God saves his children in stages, not all at once. Now, don't misunderstand me. We're already saved. We're forgiven and justi justified because of what Jesus did for us at the cross and the empty tomb. When we come to him in faith and repentance, he eternally saves us from the penalty of our sin. But we are not yet free from corruption and death. You know, this is interesting. This is a little side note about faith today. So, it's interesting. You that are parents know who your children are, especially mothers. You know what your house is. You know what your clothes is. You know. And the reason why you know is because you were there. But none of us ever saw Jesus. So how do we know that Jesus is there? How do we know that he was sent to save us? Because of faith. I can think of three times in the Bible, right off, right off the bat, that drive home this this thing of faith the woman who was inflicted with blood all she thought was i just need to reach out and touch his garment and i will be healed that is faith the second one the centurion who went to see jesus because one of his servants was dying and then he said he said lord you don't need to come to my house just say it and it will be done that was faith and third, the last one, the man on the cross besides Jesus, 
The other man was ridiculing him. This man said, do you not know who this is? He has done no wrong. He, he emptied his sin to Jesus that day. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise today. That is faith. That is the faith that you have when you come and you repent. He will eternally save you from our penalty of sin. Okay, that was my little side note. Everyone in this room, I believe, is saved. But we're all going to waste away sometime. And the promise of the word of God is, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. So we're all going to waste away. Eventually, something's going to happen to us. We won't be here on this earth. The outer man is perishing. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 reminds us that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That is, we all live out our days in fragile jars of clay. One day the vessel will crack. It will break and we will fade away. That is the nature of life. If you've lived for a while in this world, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your body is getting older every day. The outer man is perishing, he is dying, he is broken, he is ruined. He's in the process of being destroyed. And the problems associated with destruction cause us to lose heart. The second thing, fallen men. Another element is the word that in the world that causes us to lose heart is other people. If this fallen nature doesn't get you, fallen people will. How many times have you talked to someone about Jesus or your faith and they've said, prove it? You can't really. You can't point to any one thing or another. You can only point to your inner self, your faith, okay? But people will try to bring you down. They are the fallen people. The foolishness of the fallen man causes him to do all sorts of destruction. Fallen nature leads people to do crazy things. Fallen nature causes people to commit numerous sins and tragedies. Fallen people let us down. Fallen people hurt our feelings. Fallen people fail the Lord. Fallen people hurt us physically, verbally, emotionally, and spiritually. And this may cause us to lose heart. This was Paul's experience. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, I read, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in his body. 2 Corinthians 4.12 So then death worketh in us. It is our experience, too, that it is so easy to lose heart when life and people turn against you. It's so easy to come to the place where you just want to quit, but you don't have to. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to become a statistic. You don't have to be one of those people who used to walk with God. You don't have to be one of those people who used to go to church. You don't have to want be one of those people who used to be faithful. You can reach a place where you do not lose heart. You can reach a place where you can press on in spite of what presses you down. You can echo the incredible statement of the Apostle Paul, for which cause we faint not, but through our outward man perish. So what we need is to come to a place that Paul came to. I want to reach the place where, though our outer man perish, I faint not. I want to come to a place where even though I am attacked from without and from within by fallen nature and a fallen world, I do not lose heart. I want to come to a place where I do not lose heart, regardless of what is going on around me or in me. <clears throat> this text helps us to just do that. In these verses, Paul shared his secret for keeping heart, even when life turns against him. So let's look at this incredible secret that Paul shares with us. The secret to not losing in heart involves at least three important realizations. Number one, we are given fresh strength every day. 
Paul reminds us that while the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is renewed day by day. The natural man, which includes the body and the mind, is dying every day. The mind and the body are assaulted by the effects of sin and sinners. As a result, <clears throat> the constant attacks on the outward man, it is perishing. Every day we, we, we lose a little step. We endure the problems that we have living in a world of sin. We see here and experience all the works against us to cause us to lose heart. The outward man is continually being destroyed right before our eyes. We can all relate to that. But while the outward man grows weaker and ever nearer to the grave, the inner man is renewed day by day. The word renew means to regenerate, to make new. Every day, the inner man is given new strength to face the trials of that day. Jesus said it this way, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew 6, 34. Well, every day brings with it a unique problem. Every day also comes with its own measure of grace from the hands of the Father in heaven. Here is his promise to you. This is from Lamentations, Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my potion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It's also, it is said, and as the days show shall the strength be. Deuteronomy 33, 25. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The inner man is renewed every day. But we need to understand that this is not a one-time drink that guarantees us daily strength and renewal. The Lord is offering us a fountain in which we can drink every day. Drinking from the fountain, he offers promises us that the inner man will be renewed, re regenerated, and refreshed day by day, even while the outer man grows weaker and weaker. So each day has its own troubles. Matthew says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Thus, each day demands its own supply of grace. Maybe your car is not running. Your spiritual metabolism cannot survive yesterday's meals. You need to eat fresh food every day. Your spiritual dosage that brought healing to your heart yesterday will not help your symptoms today. You need a fresh dose for the ailments of a fresh day. Your bucket leaks. What you brought up from the well yesterday will not be sufficient for the trials you will be called on to face today. No spiritual fuel was designed to run your car for 10 years. No single spiritual meal will power your life for months at a time. No spiritual inoculation will cure the ailments of the new day. The inner man is renewed day by day. He is renewed by fresh fuel, by fresh food, by a fresh medicine. What does this mean? It means you need to feed on the word of God every day. How do you do that? Through the Bible. You need to pray to the Father every day. You need to fellowship of fellow Christians every day. You need to seek fellow Christians in church, online or in person, every time you can. You need a fresh supply every day. It's no wonder that so many lose heart. They make no investment in the renewing of the inner man day by day. They feed their bodies, which are perishing. They put gas in their car and keep changing the oil. 
but those cars are just rotting away. We go to the doctor, we take our medicines, we take care of our bodies, which are eventually perishing. Yet we make no provision for the inner man who must be renewed day by day. That is why we lose heart. We lose heart because we focus our attention on, on everything, that one thing that matters most in our lives. We take no thought for our relationship with God, for the renewing on the inner man day by day. Nothing we face in this life will last forever. Notice carefully language Paul uses. He says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What does this mean for a moment? Because this is not how it feels when trials come, is it? It never feels light. It never seems to be over in a moment. The word affliction refers to tribulations, troubles, pressures. The word light means easy. So here Paul says the pressure he's under is easy. Now, this is not how Paul described his troubles earlier in his book. Here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 1.8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. In that verse, Paul tells us that his troubles more often than he could handle. He says they pushed him beyond his natural bounds. It was literally more than he could take. Now he comes back and tells us that they are light. They are easy. They are merely here for a moment. The word moment means for the instant. What Paul is saying is this. The problems of life that seem so heavy right now, the troubles that seem that they will never end, the burdens we think will break us under their weight are really just weighty for the moment. He tells us that compared with the eternal weight of glory that we will experience when we arrive home in heaven, Everything we face here is light and easy. Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Nothing we face here is worthy to, comp to be compared with the glory we will experience there. Our problem is here. We hear this, but we don't believe it. What we believe is what we see. What we believe is what we feel. What we believe is the pressure we feel. We never think it's easy. We never hear a believer testify about their problem and say they are light. The reason Paul could say this and we can't is all a matter of perspective. We have our eyes on the here and now. Paul has his on the then and there. Paul says, in verse 18, he reveals the secret for not losing heart when life tries to kill you. He says that everything in this world is temporal. It is merely here for a short time, and it will pass away. But what we can't see, those things that are ours in heaven, the eternal in nature. We will groan for a few short, for a few days here, but we will rejoice forever there. We will feel pain here for a short time but we will experience his glory there forever. The psalmist said it in Psalms 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The secret for not losing heart is maintaining the proper perspective. Ask the Lord to help you to get your eyes off what you can see and to help you to look beyond the world to the glory of awaits in his presence. That was how Moses made it. By faith, he, for, he forsook, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And that's how Abraham made it. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned into the land of promise as a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That is how Stephen made it.
But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. That's how you will, that's how you will make it. Remember, it did not come to stay. It came to pass. Everything we face in life has meaning. Paul tells us that our affliction worketh for us. That is an amazing statement. When things happen in our lives, we often look at them, think they are meaningless. Wonder how anything that painful and senseless or tragic can have meaning. It does. If you're a child of God, nothing that happens in your life is meaningless. Everything that takes place is all part of your father's plan to develop you as his child. Just a reminder, God didn't save you to make you happy. He didn't save you to bless you. He saved you to make you like Jesus. That is his eternal purpose. Here's how Paul said it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among, among many brethren. <clears throat> Thus, nothing in your life as a Christian is meaningless. Some things appear to be that way, don't they? Consider for a moment the life of John the Baptist. John was a fearless preacher. One day John dared to tell King Heron, that he had sinned against God by marrying his brother's wife. Herod cast John into prison. John languished there for 16 months. Then one night, Herod had a party. At the party, the teenage daughter of his wife was called to dance before the men assembled at the feast. She came and danced, a very bad dance. Herod was so moved that he offered to give her anything she wanted, up to half of his kingdom. She consulted with her mother, and he told to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She went back to the king and made her a request. Though it made him sad to do it because Herod actually liked John, but to save face with the crowd, he consented to her request and he had John beheaded. Herod sent soldiers to the prison and they executed John, bringing his head back to Herod's place where it was presented to the girl. Meaningless? The greatest man living in the world at the time, according to the testimony of Jesus himself, was executed to satisfy the depraved whims of a wicked woman and her daughter. From our perspective, the death of John the Baptist was meaningless. But from God's perspective, the act had eternal significance in John's life. John used that meaningless event at the doorway through which he ushered John from time to eternity. I hope the last thought that went through John's head was, we do, not, we do not faith for our light affliction, but which is but for a moment, worketh for us far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. Listen to me. If sickness comes to drain away your life, it's not meaningless. If your heart breaks down and your dreams shatter, it's not meaningless. If someone you love dies, it's not meaningless. If your car fails and you get late for work and get yelled at, it's not meaningless. When people of God pastors struggle with problems in the ministry, it's not meaningless. Parents, when you struggle with your children and their decisions, it's not meaningless. When tragedies of this life pile on you one after another, you are broken, weary, and battered, it is not meaningless. No, these things are working for you. They are for your benefit. One day when this life is over and you step out of time and into eternity, you'll find yourself relieved from the light afflictions of the moment and swallowed up in the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Apostle Paul says, and I quote, for I reckon that the sufferings of this great present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So in conclusion, how do we not lose heart? We do that by seeing that the inner man is rewarded day by day. We do that by preaching to ourselves. We do that reminding ourselves of the truth found in the passage. Look all the way back. We are earthen vessels. We are weak 
We need a power that is outside ourselves if we were to stand. That power comes from God. Preach the truth of our own heart every day. This isn't about you. It's about him. It reminds us that we will be troubled here because Jesus was troubled here. God is doing in us what he did in him. God is revealing himself through us just like he did through Jesus. The, the only people can see the light inside your vessel is for the vessel to be broken. Preach this truth to your own heart every day. Remind us that God has a plan in all of this. He will see us through the storms of this life and deliver us safely to his home to glory. This truth of your heart every day, preach it to yourself. Remind yourself that everything in life is for the glory of God. Again, remind you that life is not about you, but about what you want or your life's decisions. It is about God receiving glory in all things. We are challenged to get our eyes off this world with its sin and problems. We are told to look beyond this life to the one that is coming. In that coming world, the cares of this life will seem as nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Preach that truth to the heart every day. Live in the truth who you are in Jesus Christ. You are a pilgrim and a stranger. You are just a person passing through this world on your way home. Along the way, you will become disillusioned, defeated, and discouraged, but you do not have to lose heart. God can and will keep you make the journey home with glory in your soul if you will keep eyes on him and not what you see. Open your hearts to Jesus. Read your Bible every day. Pray to the Lord, and you will not lose heart. Thank you for listening. Amen. 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 God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 We give all the praises. Amen. 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 Our light affliction worketh for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There is nothing that happened to us that is just by chance or it just happened or 